When I was three and a half, my sister Hannah was born with Down syndrome and it was not a prenatal diagnosis. That wasn't really a thing back in 1976, I don't think. And um, I'm the oldest of three in, um, in my family that way. And that kind of set a trajectory for the, the life of our family. Um, my dad was a school teacher and my mom was a stay-at-home mom and um, Hannah's birth, I mean, they were young. They were like 21 and 27, I think, when she was oh, born. Wow. So really kind of outside the range of what, a, a, you know, as I was an older mom when I was having babies and, you know, the risk factors go up. So, um, so really, really a surprise and, and also um, a huge gift in, in so many ways. And um, my, my parents both ended up kind of changing um, as their careers grow. My, grew, my dad ended up going into um, nonprofit work, working for an organization that uh, did advocacy and recreation and support programs for people with disabilities and had a whole career working for uh, two different organizations. My mom also um, did work in field of disabilities and disabling illnesses. And um, I, you know, this kind of became my reality. Like I was, I was four years old and I was learning about physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy. And uh, my sister started going to a separate setting school when she was about one and a half. When she got a little bit older, we lived in a really small mountain town in Colorado. Um, my dad uh, really got um, kind of his advocacy going and advocated for her to be educated in our local community. And she was the first, um, she was the first kid in our community that really went to elementary school in a mainstreamed uh, setting, which is the words that were used back right. in the eighties. And um, and so advocacy. Um, and support was was just part of who our family was, and and um, and my sister is really amazing. And when I got out of college, I ended up also going into disability services, and I worked um, I worked in recreation. I worked in what's called respite care, which is providing support services to families that are in uh, or you know just need a break from caregiving because it can be a lot. I worked at an inclusive preschool mm -hmm. and um, it was half kids with disabilities, half kids without. And I ran a, a library that was a family support center for uh, families, um, all, all families, um, but was able to provide some specific resources for people with um, kids with disabilities. And then I was a early intervention um, case manager and um, developmental evaluator for a number of years with our local early intervention program working with families zero to three. Oh, um, Sarah, what an amazing background you have. Well, it, you know, I really, I loved the work. I, I really, it, and it was just, it was an extension of, of who I was and who my family was. And and then um, I became a mom myself um, when, when my first two were little, I was working as a case manager and developmental evaluator. And it, it just kind of got to be a lot of working all day with families who had um, kids who were either born with a diagnosis or they were trying to figure out what was going on. And I've got these two little kids at home. Um, and I just, it just kind of became a lot. And that was, that was where my yoga practice. I dabbled a little bit with some, you know, Rodney Yee videos um, in the past, um, but that that's really where it became really, um, I needed yoga to balance myself, but then also just realized like I, it was too much for me to be um, trying to parent really well these two children, um, one of whom it was kind of an intense baby and can sometimes still be, and um, now as a 14 year old, but um, but then the the wanting to give the best to families, and I just kind of rec reached a, I I reached the understanding that that I wasn't going to be able to give my best in both places, and mm -hmm. so I was able to come home and be a full time mom. In and during that time, um, that little window. I had another baby, my third, and went to, um, I did my yoga teacher training shortly 
thereafter. And, um, and I really kind of thought like, okay, there, there was one career and now I have this new career as a yoga teacher. And it was a few years into my teaching yoga where I started to just kind of look around and say, where are, um, where are the people with disabilities? Like, mm. what, you know, who's doing this for people with disabilities? And um, that sent me on a Google search and I found uh, Matthew Stanford of Mind Body Solutions based out of um, Minneapolis. And um, do, do you know Matthew? I do, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I studied, started studying with him in 2014 and um, I'm, I'm what they call a repeat offender. <laughs> I had to take in all the classes a number of times and, and, um, and really, you know, Matthew's work primarily focuses on, um, on physical disability and, um, and trauma and things like that, which is, which is super interesting. And I learned a lot and, um, through my, one of my practicums for one of their programs, I started working with a private client who has cerebral palsy and just amazing, amazing woman that, um, I, I'm still, I still work with from time to time, COVID's changed that. But um, so, so that was sort of this, this opening for me of like, okay, there, there is a world in there. And, and then I, I, but I've still got like, you know, this heart for people with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities. And I remember after maybe my first or second training at Mind Body Solutions, I, I walked up to Matthew and I said, I said, I am loving this. This is so great who is doing, who is doing this work um, that I can learn from with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? And he looked at me and he just, he's got this like very like magical kind of um, like fairy like smile kind of, you know, like mm -hmm. a bee smile. And, um, and he's like, he's like, there's not a lot of people out there doing it. So why not you? And I was like, what you know <laughs> uh why not me okay i don't i don't know how would you say you had to i mean it's great because it, he did, did the absolute right thing because you have such a long history of working uh with so many different types of people and you have you know the heart connection to um you know someone with a disability and so the, i don't know i think that really helps a lot um in terms of just really trying to get in there and and have like deep empathy without it without othering people mm -hmm. i think i don't know that's just a thought that i had um how would you say you took some of like what you learned um from matthew in terms of creating an inclusive space um and addressing you know the 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 physical options uh, for physical disabilities and then, and then started to bring in your work from the past of working with people from, with developmental dif disabilities. How, how did you, how did you mentally kind of merge those two, two things? Yeah. So one of the things that, that Matthew will talk a lot about is, is breaking down, um, yoga poses and, and recognizing what, parts of poses are doing energetically and then how you can access that like he he teaches a lot with with prana and um a lot of like super detail he he um comes out of the Iyengar Iyengar, tradition. yeah i remember that so yeah. um so so a lot a lot of that but i think that that what that's helped me to do is think about um you know what what are the different pieces that are happening in a pose and so what are what are ways that it can look like so we can take a pose like garudasana you know and say if we're sitting in a chair we can cross our legs and we can give ourselves a hug mm. and in so many ways energetically it's the same thing as our as our eagle pose but i'm accessing um a way to help folks connect with themselves it's tactile stimulation and we can talk about especially like during covid like we couldn't hug people oh, um, so true. you know and so like we, i know we can't give each other hugs but let's like give ourselves a hug together and 
And so thinking about, you know, and maybe we don't even cross our legs and we're just still giving ourselves a hug, but I, I know I've got Garudasana in there, right? Because yeah. that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're closing, you know, we're opening the back of the spine. Um, and, and Matthew teaches a lot about the spine and the, the movements of the spine. And so I'm always thinking about, even if I'm, if I'm creating a sequence that, that may not be talking a ton about the spine to my folks, I'm still thinking about how do I give their spines an experience? And I make sure that I'm, that I'm covering, you know, do we have some, some forward bending? Do we have back bending? Do we have, you know, lateral bending, twisting to each side and then neutral? And it might sound a lot different if I was teaching a class at the YMCA, um, where I'd be talking about those different kind of things, but it's all in there, um, knowing that, you know, I think Matthew would say that the spine has knowledge, you know, that's separate, you know, the spine and the body have knowledge that's separate from the knowledge that the mind has. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that doesn't mean we talk about, we talk about stretching side to side and do you notice how that feels good? Um, you know, we talk about like one of the things when we do seated cat and cow, we call it turtle going in and out of their its shell. And I have mm -hmm. this picture of a, one turtle with its neck sticking out and a turtle in its shell on top of it. And, you know, we, we were doing that flexion and extension of the spine, but I've given them a visual as a reference right. to think about what they're doing with their body. And Matthew talks a ton about, about reference as a way to access what's happening between your body and your mind. Um, and he does that as someone who experiences a paralyzed body is that his, his sensation isn't giving him reference. So what are some other ways that we can find that? So. And um, visual learning. That's, that's interesting. I didn't, I wouldn't have thought of that as something that would help him in his body. Like you said, I know that for kids with learning disabilities, um, visual learning can be incredibly helpful because sometimes auditory learning is delayed or auditory learning is, yeah. is just not as effective as, as, as visual learning. So you're, so that's an interesting thought you're giving the, the auditory cues and then you're giving your visual cue. And then sometimes you're ass assisting with, an outside visual cue, like you said, an yeah. image. That's so smart. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and thinking about, you know, that, that so much of, of what we use for languaging around the poses is, it, you know, it gives you a reference, but in your mind. So when I say we're going to do um, tree pose, you know, our physical bodies don't actually look that much like a tree, but because we know that there's a tree, we can access our memory and then understand that connection. So what I'm doing with, you know, with my, my yoga pose cards is just showing them a picture of the tree. And then, like you said, doing the, the tree pose. And we talk about like our feet are the roots, our spine and our core is the trunk. And then our arms are the branches. Can, can you feel the wind blowing through your branches? And it just creates another way for them to connect in a way that I think takes their they're learning a little deeper. Like if I just, if I, before I had the flashcards and was doing that, they would follow my body movements um, because that's, you know, they're, they are very well expected in their lives to do what the leader in charge mm -hmm. of them says mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the things I think about what Jason teaches a lot is that, that as a, as a teacher, like, don't just be a facilitator, really be a teacher and take um, or give people opportunities to keep deepening their knowledge. And, mm -hmm. and I've just watched, you know, over the last year of using these visual uh, references is that like, they learn the poses better, they're learning the sequencing better, they, they are able to talk with me more about mm -hmm. what they're experiencing and what this feels like. And I, I know which ones are their favorites. And so it, for me, it's been a huge um, leap forward in, in connecting with folks to give that additional form of what Matthew would call reference. That's um, awesome. That's so great. And I can just, when, as you're talking about it, it makes sense. Like if you do have any delays, right. In, in any brain development, accessing memory, different levels of memory can be really challenging. Right. So like even just working memory, right. Which is like our fastest, like you see, you know, you see Sarah do a tree 
you do three other poses and then it's like you maybe can't access that image of Sarah again the way someone else can right because your working memory might be you know not as acute so um to have that assistance I would imagine would really kind of um relax people too right like they're not as trying to focus on one way of learning it it's like okay that that visual assistance is there and so they can kind of I would bet they could kind of like it's interesting that you say that they can talk about it more and it makes sense it just intellectually to me just makes sense right because it's like yeah it's more accessible and and for folks that have autism as well you know that that you know different people experience autism different ways but but some of them are very literal and so by showing them a picture of the tree you know i think that that probably helps them yes get into absolutely. get into it more and you know when i our classes are very conversational like we're we're you know having conversation the entire time you know partly i'm asking them you know, do you feel where it's stretching in your rib cage? You know, do you feel how strong you are? Let's let's say this mantra together, um, and then, you know, they they might say, "Oh, this also reminds me of um, this reminds me like we we rock forward and back as a way of doing some spinal flexion." And and um, I say it's like we're rocking in a rocking chair, and um, and they're this one guy is like at, like at the cracker barrel which is a i don't oh, know if y'all have yes, cracker barrel yes, out, yes. out there but you know and so now that's become part of what we do when we when we rock forward and back um we rock like we're rocking in a rocking chair at the cracker barrel and sometimes they're telling me i like to uh, i like to go to the cracker barrel with my mom and or you know i get pancakes when i go to the cracker barrel and and all of that is part of our yoga practice because we are connecting it's an opportunity for me to listen to them, to learn about their lives. And, and we're doing movement and breath and um, and all of that together. But it, you know, it's not gonna look like a flow class where everyone's silent when they come in and the only voice that is heard is the is the yoga teachers. But we're doing that deep work of of really connecting our humanity while we move and breathe and experience you know, what does it mean to be human and alive together? Mm, That's a great, you just kind of like described your whole mission statement there, (laughs) which is, which is great. um, Because I hadn't thought to ask you that question of like, what is your overall philosophy, like when you go into that room? Um, And uh, yeah, I would think that working with, like you said, you know, autism is different in everybody. And everybody's brain is different. And so if you're working with um, people with an array of different kinds of disabilities, I would imagine that it would require you to, I I mean, to go in and and have it be slightly conversational, whether that's literal or whether it's watching for a while until you learn what their needs are. Um, So yeah, I I was wondering like when you first started teaching these classes, a, how nervous were you because you you're not exactly sure like what their needs are and then B, how did you approach that how did you figure out how to structure a class so that you were really serving them yeah well i think i, I think that when i first started um having a background working with folks with intellectual disabilities for a long time was helpful. So that I felt really comfortable around the population. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then also I think having, again, that background in kids yoga, not like I am very strongly, like we do not treat adults with cognitive disabilities like children. It's not that, but it's again, that having that like more creative, more imaginative, less um stuck to this is what the yoga sequence has to be like i knew Mm -hmm. from being a kids yoga teacher that you can do pranayama over here and you can do mantra over here and like like that that things are not they do not have to be in xyz order got it yeah in order for you know the yoga gods to show up right (laughs) Right, Um, right. so um so having that flexibility but i mean a lot of it um, a lot of it is is really just trial and error, and that is very much something that I learned at Mind Body Solutions from Matthew. Is that is that 
you got you you try and something's not going to work and you try another thing and it's not going to work and then you try something and it does work at least for today and you and you go with it um and then um when when i do teacher trainings i always tell people that like as a good yoga teacher you like beg borrow and steal <laughs> from from like when you see something that's working for other teachers you remember it and you try it um with your folks and so just really like finding and trying and i i work every week I work with four different groups and I use the same lesson plan sequence. And we, if you want, we can talk about what I learned from Jason's um, sure, sequencing sure. class about how to adapt that for, for my folks, but the, they're totally different classes each time um, because at the one place they, you know, they really like talking about the rocking chair, the cracker barrel and another class, they just really have fun when we wave our feet in a foot parade, you know, when oh, we're yeah. doing our ankle mobility and um, another place, they love doing lion's breath. And so, mm. you know, we, we do goddess pose as a bear. And so we'll, we'll, um, you know, use lion's breath there. We'll use it as lion's pose, you know, and, and so just, the, the sequence may be the same that I've got planned out for my classes, but based on my relationships with the students and their, you know, their mood for the day, like I might show up and they're just, you know, really excited because it's somebody's birthday. And then how do I capture that, um, you know, and vice versa. And so I think the way that I made progress in, in my own kind of development as a teacher was just by paying close attention on, on what worked and what didn't work. And, um, and then knowing that anytime a new person is, is coming, it's a reshuffle of the deck, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and not getting too caught up in, it has to, it has to look good. It has to, you know, like we have to have a quiet Shavasana. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes I was going to ask about that, like energetically, um, you know, do you have any, not goals? That sounds so. I don't know if that's not the right word, but do you, um, do you notice energetic changes? Like when you start with a group versus a few weeks later, um, do you notice just, do you know what kind of, um, energetic shifts do you notice throughout a class or does it change every time? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I would say that, um, that especially in the classes that I'm working with now, we, we went to weekly classes during, you know, when everyone was in lockdown and did online. And then as things have slowly come back to in person, um, I, I definitely, they, they know that feeling of, of calm relaxation that's going to happen in yoga and they want to get there too. Yeah. Um, and, and so that is that is for sure something that um, we have a common shared goal on, and I also I also leave a lot of room for there there might be folks in the group that don't want to get on their mats or in their chairs and participate, and and so I say like you know presence is participation. That's I have, so nice, Sarah. That's so nice <laughs> to just allow well, people to be themselves, and like you said, like so often you know. We're, I'm sure that, like you said, that, that there's just so much compliance is required in their yeah. lives, like to follow yeah. these directions and these rules and line up here and do this next in your schedule. Yeah. And so to just allow them to be there without forcing is like, that's such a gift. Yeah. And I, I have, um, I have a bag of things that I, that I bring with me to my classes. And so like, I've got a coloring book with you know, mandalas in it. I've got um, like a glitter meditation jar that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've i got some um, like bendy dolls. I've got a breathing ball. And I, you know, for the folks that don't want to necessarily participate, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say, would you like one of the bendy dolls today? And so instead of doing the yoga, they might oh, that's so bend, nice. you know, they might listen and bend the dolls. I've got a collection of books of like the yoga and mindfulness books. They can read a book instead and they're still there. They and some still of them be there with everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them don't want to do any of the poses, but they love the guided relaxation at the end. Um, one, one guy I've got, he really, he just kind of sits in his chair and likes to rock the whole time, but but there are songs that we sing and um, 
some days he wants singing, sometimes he doesn't. So like I check in and say like, hey, Michael, are we, um, you know, while we do our boat pose, are we going to sing, you know, are we going to sing about a boat? And he'll, he'll say yes or no. And then we do or we don't. And, you know, so it's like he might not be doing the boat with us, but he he likes the singing and the chanting. And that's part of yoga, right? But the mm-hmm. yoga tradition is singing and chanting and breathing. And so that's there. If if another guy is sitting there listening and, and you know, moving the, the little creatures and, you know, dolls into the poses, like I, I personally think that's still participating Oh yeah. In the yoga experience. Absolutely. Um, That's brilliant. The dolls with that can bend and that is brilliant. Yeah. And that, you know, again, like it's not that it, it's not that I'm treating anyone like a child. I'm not no, just giving them choices, but yeah. And it's, it's that, how do I make this accessible? Like maybe, maybe it's too sensory stimulating for you to do these asanas and these pranayamas and you can still participate in these other ways because that's another thing I've learned from Matthew Sanford too, is that, is that for a, um, you know, for neurotypical people, we like the stimulation and the prana opening that comes from the yoga practice. But for some people who are in disabled bodies, it's just too much. Like, so Mm -hmm. to put your pranayama with your asana, you know, with your, you know, mental focus, like it, it can just like short circuit people. And why do I need to overlay my expectations on my students? You know? Right. 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 I mean, you're, you're, it's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's also teaching them to trust their inner cues, right? If on a day it's not happening for them, it doesn't feel right for whatever it could be anxiety. It could be, it could be anything. Yeah. It's gotta be just, that's part of yoga is to be able to, uh, reflect and make skillful options from moment yeah. to moment. So yeah, or skillful choices. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, I guess one of the reasons I asked about like the energetic shifts is just because I know for neurotypical people, it's so beneficial for us to, um, to have this practice that helps our nervous systems and to like have that that mind body memory. Um, so I was wondering, you know, how much of a, of a benefit do you see, um, in terms of teaching them to access that, that calm part of, of the nervous system? And, um, if you get any feedback about that? Yeah, I think that at the, at the end of every class, I, I give a a moment. I say, does anybody, would anybody like to share a a movement word or gesture about how they're feeling at the end of class. And, and usually I get, you know, thumbs up or peace signs or people saying I'm happy, I'm peaceful. Um, and again, because that's been in repetition for so long, I think that that like, they understand that that's where we're headed and, Mm. and getting to, um, and, and I don't know, like, I, I don't know, that I have them reporting back and saying like, I was mad at my mom, but I did three deep breaths and now I feel better. I don't, you know, that is, doesn't really happen, but I, I know that, um, you know, like we've got folks, like sometimes folks will start to be disruptive during Shavasana and other folks will be like, please stop that. I like this part. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And, and, so, or, you know, I'll, I'll come in and, and I'll say like, okay, you guys, I had kind of a, like, yoga exercise plan, but you seem like you're really kind of in a chill place. Is that, is that true? And they'll be like, yeah, Sarah, can we just do the relaxation part today? And I'll be like, yep, absolutely. Um, you have to be so, so flexible with your plans. <laughs> and your- <laughs> yeah. But, but I think that I, I think that that's, um, you know, I, I want to be serving my students, you know, I, I and, and if I'm teaching a, you know, just a flow class either, I, I don't ever want to come in and um, you know, think that my agenda is the most important thing happening in the room mm-hmm. and I'm there to, I'm there to serve and support. And, um, and I do think that that, that is kind of one of the fundamental teachings that we learn through practicing yoga is, is how to shift in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and move with the, you know, with what's happening and, and how do we let that be part of the cohesive whole. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, 
I'm going to ask a question that's just been brewing. I think I've got it complete in my mind now. What are some misunderstandings that you think people have about adults with cognitive disabilities that you would like for people to know or understand better? Mm. Yeah. I think that I think that sometimes people think or behave in ways that suggest that they think that um, that they are overgrown children. Mm. You know that there that there isn't the nuance of um, of still being an adult and having a you know limited capacity in an intellectual way. Um, I think for sure on people with Down syndrome, there's this there's this um, notion that they're always happy <laughs> they're, mm-hmm. they're they're not always happy they're not you know they have a wide range of emotions just like everyone else mm-hmm. um i think that um that there's sort of this this worry that you could offend or hurt people um and and that's you know they're humans they're they're people they want connection um more than more than anything else and then i i think that um you know that that there is there can be discomfort you know there can be things like you know sometimes people don't have the same kind of grooming habits or um, you know if people are drooling or not able to to manage their their body in the same ways that that can be sort of off-putting but but i think if you can recognize that as part of the disability and look beyond um kind of some of the the physical presentations like there's so much gift uh, Mm -hmm. for you and um and and recognizing that that like that that comes up for you like that that like if you see someone that's that's drooling that that might activate part of your brain that you know i think about inside out movie you know like your disgust you know goes off which is normal like right like but but like how do i how do i tolerate that discomfort for what i've learned from my yoga practice and move beyond that Right. Um, and right. I think I think just just that that idea to answer your question, I hope, is that is that there's there's more in common with with folks than there is that's different. And so, like, how do you find that shared humanity? Because they might like the same band that you do. They might have the same favorite movie. They might have the same favorite yoga pose as you. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, you might like to go to Cracker Barrel too. <laughs> yeah. In the chair. And exactly. like, how do you? Yeah. How do you um, just make those very human connections in a way that is, you know, heart to heart and and not dependent on, um, you know, you being the exact same. Right. Right. The essence, our essence is the same. The presentation yeah. of things might might look a little different sometimes. Might not. Behaviors might be a little different sometimes. But when you think about it in the in the in the scheme of all the people you know that's true with everyone you know so right right and what, what do you do when when you find someone doing something off-putting in your life in any capacity hopefully like you said you recognize it in yourself and um maybe you get curious about yeah you know what's why that's happening or um you know so that instead of immediately reacting or judging you're like just more more curious about it yeah and you can use yoga techniques you know if someone is getting agitated you can say you know do you think it would help if we took three deep breaths together you know or like okay it seems it seems like you're having a strong emotion can you tell me what that is or where do you feel that in your body Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and using what you know about your own yoga practice it you know to facilitate that that conversation, that connection, you say, oh yeah, when I get mad, I feel it in my hands, they get all hot or, you know, whatever it is for mm-hmm. you. And mm-hmm. um, you use that, that understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does your sister like to do yoga with you? I know in my own family, it's hard to get my child to do yoga with me. So I, I know sometimes family members have the hardest time teaching family members, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She does. So, so um, I live in North Carolina. She lives in Colorado and um so we don't get to see each other very much but she really does um she does like to do yoga with me and um we did a we did a series uh last year uh where we we kind of did uh, we we got on zoom and other people were invited and we we did yoga together and sometimes you know we'll we'll just 
get on and do yoga. And whenever she comes to Charlotte, she loves to do yoga with me. Oh, that's so um, nice. Yeah. So she is not my kids. On the other hand, they, they were great when they were little and you know, no, that they're teenagers. They don't really want to have much to do with it, but <laughs> yeah, she, she does. Um, and she, she loves, um, she loves doing challenging poses. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she wants me to help her, you know, figure out how to do wheel. And there's this, um, reclined handstand that I've learned, um, from, from Matthew's, uh, or uh, adaptive yoga training that's where you're you're up against a wall and it's it it energetically simulates um so you're on your back but you, you bring your body into um you know a handstand position and really energetically your 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 um your vestibular sense somehow like really feels like you're balancing in oh, space wow. and she really? she always wants to do that one and um and so she really she goes for the yoga circus tricks uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I can't blame her it keeps things no. interesting <laughs> yeah well she's like she's all she's always been such a daredevil she was like a, a special Olympic slalom oh, ski wow. racer oh, and um, always wanting to do the like crazy amusement park rides so uh -huh. um, it makes sense you know it goes with her personality that she would want to like you know be like oh is there a hard yoga pose I want to I want to let's figure it out how can yeah, I do yeah, it yeah so, yeah 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 one of the um, things that you mentioned um, in your email to me was that um, I think you took Jason's sequencing course. Is that the one that you took? I or... took in all three oh, of them. Oh, yeah. But yeah the sequ... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And yeah, and you you mentioned that you were able to adapt um, his concepts. And um, when he got your email, he was so excited um, <laughs> because he was like, this is what I try. I'm trying to empower people to do, which is to take these foundational concepts and apply them in a way that makes sense in their teaching, in their personality, and then with their students. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So um, I, I loved that, that class and it really helped me think about like, what is it that I'm that I'm trying to do and how can I section it out? And um, so we have a sequence that we do um, our yoga warm ups, which is kind of that spinal movement thing. Um, we then have a section that are called head to toe stretches. Um, and that's where we, we, I start up at the head and neck and we work all the way down to our toes. That in, that's where we do some, um, some breath work and some vocalizations. Um, we do a version of of an ohm that we call ah, ooh, mm, which I learned mm. from the love your brain training and it mm. segments it into smaller sections. And I don't know about the really love your fun. brain training. Oh, you don't. Oh, no. you got to know about that. So okay. they, they do, um, they do training for folks who want to work with survivors of traumatic brain injury. And then they also work directly with folks who've experienced traumatic brain injury and even post concussion situation. So, okay. um, they're, they're an amazing organization Great. as well. Okay. Um, and, and there's also, there's a lot of things that I've learned from that population, um, like learning about that population that is helpful with adults with, uh, cognitive intellectual disabilities too. Okay. So, so we do, you know, we work our way from our head to our toes with our stretches. And then the next section, I call it strength builders and yoga fun stuff. So that's where we do more traditional asana and um, we do like some intuitive movement, somatic kind of stuff. We might, you know, we might play like, you know, uh, like yoga, Simon says, or something, um, you know, if, if it's like a playful fun day, not, not all the time, like a lot of times we're not doing yoga games, but we're doing the more traditional yoga poses. And, um, and I always try to include some intuitive movement. I just think that that's such a, a cool thing that's happening in yoga space, um, now. So maybe that's yoga dancing. Sometimes we, I say like, if you were a piece of cooked spaghetti, move like you were a piece of cooked spaghetti and just, or, you know, when it was near Halloween, we were having a Halloween theme and I was like, you know, ghosts don't have any bones. So move like a ghost that doesn't have any bones. Mm. And that just helps folks kind of act again, like giving that reference for mm -hmm. like, what would that, what would that look like, you know, I, I I'm not going to say intuitive movement because that's not going to make sense. But and now that I say that, sometimes I would say that's, this is called intuitive movement. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, we call mm -hmm. it yoga dancing. 
Um, and then um, after that, we do a yoga cool down. So variations on poses like child's pose or uh, Baddha Konasana, um, those, those you know, twists, those kind of things that are your traditional yoga cool down poses. Then we do relaxation and meditation. So usually I'm doing a guided a guided meditation, like a, you know, part of a yoga nidra or just a, a body scan, or I might, you know, you know, I might, you know, give, tell a little story where they're incorporating their senses. Um, in February, we did a, um, a five senses, you know, what you see, what you smell, what you hear, what you taste, what you touch. And we did that in our imagination at the end. And then depending on the group, um, some of my groups are better at that than others. Um, we might have a minute of quiet. We might be, okay, last week we did a one minute. Let's see if we can do two minutes and just see you know, how, how that goes. And then after that, um, we, we sit up and I give everybody an opportunity to, if they wanna share a word, phrase, or gesture, you know, movement, gesture, sign, language, you know, whatever they wanna share, um, they don't have to. And then we always close with the same with the same thing. Um, so some things are the same every every time, like the closing and the yoga warm up are are pretty much the same every time. And then, like based on what I learned in Jason's class, I keep things consistent for a month. So we learn a new meditation technique every month. We have a different yoga pose sequence every month. I might throw in a couple of different. Um, different techniques in the head to toe stretches just to keep it kind of varied. Mm -hmm. But I loved what he taught about how the, the repetition actually helps deepen learning and that you are helping your students grow when they have some idea of what to expect. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was a huge, a huge takeaway um, from that. But it was, it was really, you, you asked a question earlier that was sort of like, how did you figure out what was working and mm -hmm. and this was a huge thing for me to just say like okay put it into this container and it doesn't mean that you're repeating yourself every single week but you are you are giving them a framework and because so many of them thrive on routine it is really good but then i'm still layering in new things yeah. and like okay so like it's, i remember one day I was just feeling really tired, honestly, of doing the head to toe stretches. And I, so I said, y'all, let's take a vote. Should we do head to toe stretches or should we do toe to head stretches? And they were like, let's do toe to head stretches. And so we <laughs> did it backwards, you know, um, which was just, you know, it just gave me a little mental break, <laughs> but, uh -huh. but also it was just like fun. And, um, but still within that container. That's great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you're having that permission to do that and not feel yeah. like, oh, I'm repeating myself. <clears throat> but I would imagine also repeating it gave you more feedback in terms of if it was working or not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then it also, like, I think another thing that, um, I don't know if Jason said this so much as I just, as I just watched in the classes that, that, um, having personal connections with your students whenever you can is going to deepen it. Like in, in some of the courses that I took with him, there were some of his longtime students there and he really, you know, he would say, Hey, I know that you've got a shoulder thing. And like, that just is so nice. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, to know that, you know, Jason Crandall is paying attention to you and that, that what's going on with your shoulder matters Yeah, in the same way, in the same way, like I, I absorbed, that I mean, I think that that was there for me already, but also like, okay, so, so Paul really loves the rocking chair, but, you know, but Russell really loves the yoga pizza, which is, you know, what we call when we do the wide legged forward fold, you know, and so like, and then I can say like, oh, you know, or like Cynthia's got yoga dancing coming up next. This one's for you, honey, uh -huh. you know, and that, and really letting that, um, like the more that we, that we have that routine, the more I'm able to know this is a way that I can connect with that student. Mm. And, and then, um, you know, like I can bring that back in a couple months, you know, if, if I, if I feel like, all right, we gotta, gotta make sure that everybody is feeling recognized and, and, um, acknowledged and loved where they are and what they, what they enjoy. And I, sometimes if we do something new, we'll, I'll go around and, 
you know, pause. I said, let's do a check-in and tell me, did you, did you like that pose? Thumbs up. You, it was okay. Like wiggle your hands or like, no, I didn't really like it. Thumbs down. And, you know, and, and give them a chance to give me feedback if we're trying something new. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because yeah, because they're, you know, they're, they are what this is for, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Sarah, do you offer teacher training? Um, I, I, yes, I am in the process of putting together something independently. I was, um, I was working with a kids yoga company, um, that, um, is sort of in a hibernation <laughs> phase right now, but, okay. um, I, I am, um, I am looking to do some, uh, trainings in, um, the latter part of the year. So it'd be yeah. great. I mean, I, yeah, um, I think it would be so beneficial for so many people. Yeah, well, I would love to. I, I love um, I love yoga training, and I love sharing insights of of how you do this work because I think there's a lot of folks out there that would like to do it, but they just feel nervous and scared. And um, so, right. yeah, so I would love to be able to get back to doing that um, again. But I'll be I'll be doing it um, kind of under under my own thing now. Yeah, absolutely. That takes some time. Um, yeah. And people can find you. Um, where can people find you? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram and Facebook at um, Sarah Henderson Yoga. It's a little tricky because it's Sarah with an H and then H for Henderson yep. Yoga. And then my website is yogaincludesme.com. Nice. Awesome. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It was just such a joy to talk to you and hear about all the work that you that you do. And thanks for thanks for sharing with us. Thank you so much for having me. Truly a pleasure.